This conversation includes violence, trauma, and graphic content, which may be triggering or some may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everyone. I'm Evelyn, the creator, producer, and host of this podcast, Reppin. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm coming to you from New York City, my home, and it's where the show originates. This episode is to mark the 9-11 anniversary. Every year we come together and honor and remember that devastating day and everyone we lost. We will never forget. But what we should also never forget is all of the unity, strength, bravery, love, and humanity that showed itself post 9-11. Those are some of the beautiful characteristics and experiences that we were all a part of and some of the very ideals that America embodies and inspires the rest of the world. My guest today was someone who was inspired by those very traits. He's an immigrant from Bangladesh and he loved watching all of the Western television shows, seeing the American cowboy, and how those images represented a wholesome goodness, fight for truth and justice. He loved it so much, he wanted to experience it for himself, so he immigrated to the United States. 10 days after 9-11, he was helping a friend and working at a gas station. When a man came in, asked him where he was from, and shot my guest in the face. My guest was shot because there was rampant Islamophobia and xenophobia post 9-11. And in very plain words, he was shot because he looked different. The shooter was ultimately apprehended and was put on death row. My guest, thankfully and miraculously, survived. But what's also remarkable is how my guest chose to respond to this horrific shooting. He's going to share what happened that night, what he said to the man who shot him, and you'll find out how and what he's been doing since. This is an unbelievable story about survival, the power of forgiveness, love of country, and being able to move forward with your trauma. Now, eventually, this episode in its entirety will be available on YouTube, closed captioned in multiple languages. It's my hope that it reaches and inspires as many people as possible. So please do share this episode and the one that will be on YouTube. With no further ado, please meet my guest, Race Bouillon. Race, thank you so much for being here. I know you literally just walked out of an edit and you look fresh like a daisy, clean shaven. But how are you? Thank you so much for making time to come here. But how are you doing? Well, I'm doing excellent. Thank you for asking. And uh, I feel blessed to be here with you. And I'm excited to have a conversation with you today. We have so much to talk about. And I definitely want to get to a documentary that you are working on that you were nice enough to show me a sneak peek at your trailer. And I have to tell you, based on the trailer, the production values there, it's rhythmically done well, it's sensitive, it's gripping, just a very well done job. And I can't wait to see it. But I'm having you here because we're going to mark a very powerful day in America's history, one of the darkest days. You were a victim of a hate crime after 9-11. And I don't think it's in my position to talk about your experience. So can you give audiences a sense of how people may know you because you were in the headlines nationally, unfortunately, and take us back a little bit to that day, only to a point where you're comfortable though. Okay, Race? Sure. Thank you for asking this question. I am a survivor of post 9-11 hate crime and the founder of the nonprofit World Without Hate. And I never imagined that one day I would dedicate my life in America, helping people to change their hearts and minds and um, finding ways to make positive impact 
to make this world a better place. If I did not go through what I went through 10 days after 9-11 terrorist attacks, most likely I would not be even speaking with you today. I grew up in Bangladesh and America was a dream country to me. And after graduating as a pilot officer from the Bangladesh Air Force, I did not feel my destiny was there. And when I get a chance to come to America to study computer science, I took it. I left my family, my home for New York City to pursue my passion. And I had a friend living in Dallas, Texas, who invited me to visit, see the Wild West. I was very excited because I grew up watching a lot of Western movies. I was excited to see the ranches, cowboys, bars with their famous swinging doors. <laughs> though I never did find one. And wear a hat. And also boots and buckles and cowboy hats as well. Okay. So I moved to Dallas, Texas a few months before 9-11 and began to work in, in my friend's convenience store by day and studying computer science by night. Ten days after 9-11 terrorist attacks, as rescuers continued to search ground zero for signs of life, our country in deep mourning, a newfound fear and uncertainty looming, what would be my last day of work as a store clerk in Southeast Dallas? Around noon, a man wearing a bandana, sunglasses, baseball cap, holding a sort of double barrel shotgun, walked in. And pointing the gun directly at my face, he asked, where are you from? And having been robbed before, I immediately opened the cash register and offered him money. The cash I placed on the counter in exchange for my life and his gaze remained fixed. And then he mumbled the question, what are you from? Despite pleading for my life, he pulled the trigger from point blank range. I felt it first, like a million bees were stinging my face and heard the sound, the explosion. I looked down, and so blood pouring like an open faucet from the right side of my head. Frantically and instinctively, I placed both hands on my head, thinking I had to keep my brain from spilling out. And I remember myself screaming. After a few seconds, as I looked left and saw the gunman still standing, pointing the gun directly at my face, I thought I had to appear dying, otherwise he would shoot me again. So I fell to the floor. He finally left, thinking I had died. The first part of my American nightmare just began. So you knew you were shot immediately, right? Because sometimes, from what I understand, the shock of being shot, you don't necessarily register it so quickly, like that trauma. But it sounds like you definitely still had your wits about you to try to do to survive. Yes, it took definitely a few seconds to realize that I got shot. And it took moments to to feel that he actually shot me in the face because there was no argument and there was no heated conversation. There was nothing. How a person could shoot somebody in the face without any kind of altercation. I could not believe that. So it took moments to process. And when I realized, oh my God, he actually shot me in the face and I'm bleeding and I'm bleeding so badly that I might die at any moment. Right. Uh, my military training kicking in. And as I fell to the floor to reduce the, the big target, I was standing still. And when I realized that if I keep on standing, I'm a big target and he will shoot me again. Yeah. So why not just jump on the floor and just act that I'm dying and maybe he would leave. And that's what he did. And as soon as he left, I stood up, grabbed the phone, but I was shaking so badly. I could not dial 911. And I ran to the next door barbershop. Three men inside looked at me in horror, assuming the gunman was right behind me. Right. They tried to escape through the emergency exit door. And to my surprise, while they're running away from me, 
Why are they not trying to help me? I'm bleeding and I'm dying. And I grabbed one of them and I begged him, please don't leave. Please call 911. I'm dying. And I don't want to die today. And when he called 911, I caught myself in the mirror. And the image reflected back was a gruesome, like something straight out of a horror movie. Within a fraction of a moment, it takes to pull the trigger. I had become disfigured, losing blood and strength rapidly, fighting to stay awake. And I'm fighting to stay alive. I did not think that my life would end like this. And today I'm dying and I would not be able to see my loved ones. I wouldn't be able to say goodbye to them. And I never imagined that I would die like this in my dream country in America like this. Sorry, I'm crying. No, it's okay to cry because I cry a lot as well. Sorry. That's a horrifying situation because you came to America because it was the land of opportunity. You no, know, it's the American dream to be here. You came from a military background. You're studying to be an engineer, right? Because you're an IT person. Yes. And you were just working at the convenience store to help your friend out, right? Yes, and also wanted to start somewhere. I never thought about, oh, why should I work in a gas station or in a convenience store? Because I wanted to build from scratch, learn American culture, learn about people, because I came here to learn. So why not learn everything I can right. to meet people? And also growing up in Bangladesh, America was a dream country to me. Watching American movies and TV shows, I was activated by what I saw, the tremendous natural beauty the seemingly endless opportunity and the generosity of the American people. And I dreamed about visiting America one day. And now here, after this incident happened to me, and I was begging God, I was seeking help from people to help me to survive. I mean, the horror of it is just unbelievable and unimaginable. But I know you did some remarkable things to stay alive while you were waiting for the ambulance. Can you sort of recap that a little bit, if you don't mind? I can tell you each and every second vividly because every single second was extremely important to me at the time because I realized at the time that I should not just lie down on a floor and wait for an ambulance to come with a stretcher to pick me up and take me to the hospital. I wanted to utilize every single second the best way I can to stay awake to stay positive and hopeful, even though back of my mind, I was thinking I would go at any moment right. the way I was bleeding. And since I was shot in the head, so when this guy from the barbershop called 911, I told myself, do not stay inside, go out in the parking lot and look for ambulance. That would save time instead of lying down. So I came out. I'm running from one set to the other and working for ambulance. And I was so lucky that within a few minutes, ambulance arrived. Right. And as soon as I saw the ambulance, I started running toward the ambulance because at the time, every single moment was precious and the tremendous desire to live, to enjoy this beautiful world. It was so powerful. I didn't want to waste a single second. I was running, taking off my shirts and shoes off. And I went behind the ambulance. And when they came out with a stretcher, they told me something that I will never forget. The paramedics told me that we are so shocked to see you running like a chicken with a head cut off. Not in a bad way, but in, in a way, seeing my tremendous desire, tremendous hope, to live, to get medical support. They were positively shocked to see me running like that. And on my way to the hospital, once I put my head on the stretcher, I could see the sky, the blue, beautiful sky. And that moment I was thinking, maybe this is the last time I would see this blue sky. And once I close my eyes, I will never see this sky anymore. It was such a painful, sad, and also, um, 
I would say this is you know, such a painful moment that I never imagined I would face something like this. And at that time, images of my mother, my father, my siblings, and my fiance appeared before my eyes and then a gray beard. And I felt my time was up. It's time to say goodbye and just begin the next journey. I was so terrified. My mouth was moving like a machine. I was reciting verses from the Holy Quran that I memorized. And I was begging God, please give me a chance. I don't want to die today. It's too early to leave this world. I have a lot of promise. I have a lot of dreams. Please give me a second chance. And if you give, God, I promise I would help others. I would dedicate my life to help others. Yeah. But you please give me a chance. Thankfully, you are here and you survived this horrific incident. And the man who shot you, he was a white nationalist, correct? He was a white supremacist? He was. Okay. Your story is so epic on so many crazy levels, from horrifying to absolutely magnificent. And I want to get to some of the turning points. Tell people what you found out about this guy, because he had been, I think, if my memory serves me correctly, he had been shooting others, correct? He did kill other people. Yes. Immediately after 9-11 terrorist attacks, he was on a shooting rampage to kill people like me, foreigners, immigrants, people, uh, brown-skinned people. And he killed Mr. Wakar Hassan on September 15th at his convenience store. He shot me in the face on September 21st. And then he killed Vasudev Patel on October 4th. And after his arrest, he told the news media that what he had done, most Americans wanted to do. They just didn't have the guts. And he claimed that he was a true American, a patriot, and he should have given medal for his actions. And he blamed me and my kind for 9-11. And he said that America was no place for Muslims. What was your response to this? I immediately realized that he was full of ignorance, full of fear and intolerance because most Americans didn't want to do that. First of all, people right. were angry. I was angry as well because New York was my first love in America. Right. That was my first home in my adopted country. So I had a special bond, special place for New York in my heart. And when this horrible tragedy happened, I was angry, but I could not express my anger because I was scared for my own life at the time when I realized that when a group of misguided foreigners, immigrants, human beings who carried out these terrible attacks, I was scared. 9-11 actually had doubled down on me because I was afraid of 9-11. At the same time, I was angry seeing what happened in New York City. So yes, people were angry at the time, but no, not all Americans, not all white Christian Americans wanted to do what he did. He blamed me and my kind for 9-11. It was tempting for me as well to blame all the Christians, all the white Americans because of his actions, because of his statement that all Americans wanted to do what he did. So if I did, that would be exactly repeating the same mistake because of which he carried out these heinous crimes. And it would be, you know, continuing the cycle of hating and blaming each other and it goes bigger and bigger. No, what he did that was completely wrong, full of ignorance, full of hate, but blaming everyone like him would be repeating the same mistake because of which he paid a big price and me and the other victims and victims' families also paid a big price. The whole thing is insane in a horrific way. But here's the part that I that I am just completely blown away by is he got caught, right? And he went, he was on death row. And you raced yes. after being shot in the face. You were holding your head together in hopes that you 
wouldn't have your brain fall out of your head, you forgave him. You actually reached out and forgave him. And not only that, correct me if I'm wrong here, Race. You worked to, to try to get him pardoned or off death row. I don't, I, so fact check me there. But here's my point. People get pissed off when the lines are too long at the stores or people get crazy because they're in traffic jams. And the world is going through some very complicated and big problems. Within that, there's a lot of division and hatred and negativity and the inability to see one another based on the people we are, not on the skin color or what's on the appearance, uh, hear each other or listen to each other and forgive each other. And here you are, race, a victim of a hate crime. You got shot in the face and you work to forgive the guy that shot you in the face. Help me with that. My God, like, how do you have that sense of just, I don't even know what it's called, not only resilience to survive, and might I say again, this is said in the most respectful way, you're a handsome man, race, despite the fact that you got shot in the face, (laughs) and you still have shrapnel in your face, right, in your head. I do. I still carry more than three dozen shotgun talents in my face. I lost vision, and I lost my fiancé. Yeah. gained more than $60,000 in medical bills after this shooting incident happened to me. There is not a single that goes by that I am not reminded of or affected by this painful tragedy. But I continue to make peace with my pain. After this incident happened to me, I was taken into a hospital, which was private and expensive. And I did not have health insurance at that time. So they discharged me next day morning and asked me to arrange follow-up medical treatments on my own. And I called this incident as the second part of my American nightmare. It put me on a roller coaster of unimaginable challenges, difficulties, and where I feel like a wounded soldier in a foreign land. I remember at the time what my parents taught me, how to move on with life after facing difficulties, after facing challenges. And I also remember the time that I was begging to God after I was shot for a second chance. I did not say, oh God, you give me a chance. And if I get better, I'm going to go after this guy. No, I was asking God simply to give me a second chance to live. Here I am with all these pain, suffering, trauma, why should I complain? God, now I look like this. I lost this. I lost it. I got my life back. So make the best use out of this. Do something positive. Turn this negative experience into something very positive so that I can fulfill my promise that I had on my deathbed. That God, if you give me a chance to live, I would help others. So instead of remaining sad, bitter, angry, depressed, which is not easy to overcome after terrible incidents like this happen to anyone, where it's easy to give up and get temporary relief in the wrong places. But my faith and my upbringing helped me a lot at the time. And I thought about what my parents taught me, that when people are mean to you, when people hurt you, when you face extreme trauma and when people try to put you down, The best thing you can do is forgive them, focus to rebuild your life and move forward. If you take time instead of responding right away, most likely you would respond wisely and it would give the other person who hurt you a chance to come back to you and asking for forgiveness or to at least to say sorry. And if you take time, the cycle of hating and hurting each other, it ends right there. If you struggle to forgive, then leave it up to God and or to the administration, to the people responsible to maintain law and order. But you move forward. But never ever think about taking revenge because that will ultimately cause more pain and suffering to you and to everyone around you and also to the perpetrator. So I deeply thought about that, which helped me to forgive my attacker, to focus on rebuilding my life. 
But then in course of time, I realized that forgiveness was not enough. And it happened to me when I went to Mecca in 2009, along with my mother. And where I deeply thought about my shooting incident. Yeah. And my attacker sitting on death row waiting to die. And I felt that forgiveness was not enough. Because I deeply felt by executing my attacker, Mark Stroman, we would simply lose a human life with the dealing with the root cause. Instead of treating him as a monster, as a killer, I saw him as a human like me. I saw him as a victim too. And I credit my faith and upbringing to give me the courage and strength, not only to forgive in the first place, but also this idea that I have to do something to save this human life. Because killing is not a solution. Hate and violence is not a solution. I have to do something. Yes, I forgive him. That makes me feel good in my heart. But what is the true benefit and impact on this forgiveness? I deeply thought about that. So when I came back from Mecca to US, I launched a global campaign with the support of Amnesty International, my Mm -hmm. friends, mentors, and the people I never met before who came forward. And people are people from all walks of lives, Hindus, Christians, Buddhists, atheists, Muslims, people from all walks of life came forward to help to save a human life. And I was deeply moved by their generosity, by their time and effort to join the campaign and save my attacker's life from Texas death row. And with the support of a reprieve, we took our campaign to the German parliament as well as to the European Union parliament to gain more support. And we also went to the headquarters of Lundbeck, the lethal injection manufacturer in Denmark, where we were able to convince the Lundbeck executives to to write a letter to the governor of Texas, Rick Perry, asking him not to use their product to kill Mark. And as a result of our visit, Lundbeck announced that they would stop supplying this drug to the U.S. prisons carrying out executions. Yeah. When you say you worked to forgive and try to go beyond that, you didn't just say it. Like you really went the extra miles, plural, to really work to get Mark off death row. He was executed. Ultimately, he was executed. But you also wrote him letters stating you're forgiving him. On a practical level of life, not having insurance, that is a shit show in America for anybody. If you walk into an emergency room for food poisoning, okay, you are hit with so many bills and it's a complicated matter. And obviously your medical needs were far more urgent than having bad sushi from a restaurant. So your insurance bills and your medical bills were astronomical. And that is the second American nightmare for you. But you're dealing with all of this, the physical pain that you must have been suffering from being shot in the face and head. Where did you find this magnanimous ability within yourself? I understand you're a man of faith, but let's get practical here, all right? The anger, the bitterness, the pain, and just the trauma And just the absolute shit show on every level, from dealing with finances, from losing your fiance, and just the trauma of all of this. Where did you find the ability to find peace within yourself and the magnanimous nature that you must have had that you were able to give to Mark before he was executed? Well, that's a very good question. Um, Kindness forgiveness, giving something to people is like a drug. Once you get used to taking that drug, once you get used to practicing kindness, showing mercy to people, when you go the extra mile to understand people, especially those who hurt you, it's like there's something you would enjoy doing again and again. It's like taking drugs, right? I grew up in a devout Muslim family 
where I said that faith played a big role, but at the same time, growing up in Bangladesh, I witnessed the plight of the poor people. I saw adults and children alike struggling to survive each and every single day to live like a human being. And they would come to our door just for a bowl of rice or maybe a piece of cloth or maybe just a little bit of money to survive. And though I grew up in a middle-class family, never had to worry about bills and where the food would come from. But their pain and suffering touched me deeply. And I enjoyed giving to those people. And every time I gave, I felt a tremendous heavenly peace in my heart that these people have nothing. They came to our door. We have more than what we need. The beauty and the fulfillment I felt at a very young age giving something to those people. And I remember one day my mother caught me red and dead while giving away one of our outfits to a poor woman who came at our door. And when my mother asked me what I was doing, I confessed this was not the first time I had given her outfits away to poor woman. And she had been wondering why her closet was thinning. And she was definitely proud of her son. And I think his kindness and giving right. spirit at a very young age. But she hugged me and urged me to enjoy growing up. I would never have imagined that I would face a similar fate like those people in my dream country in America. Right. I was always on the giving end. Never felt what it feels like to receive mercy and kindness and generosity from the others. When this tragedy happened to me, I exactly felt what it feels like to be hated, what it feels like to be on the receiving end of mercy, generosity and kindness from others. And I also deeply thought about that this incident already happened. I cannot take it back. There is no way I can erase this incident from my life. But I have the power. I have the capacity to turn these negatives into something very positive. If I stay focused, if I stay hopeful, positive, do the next right thing in the right way for the right reason, most likely I would be able to turn this scar into a beautiful tattoo. We have this power. And I deeply thought about what can I do to not only move forward, but also turn this tragedy into something positive. I told myself that I cannot stay angry, bitter, sad, and with full of destructive anger. I had to control all this negative energy. It will take time, of course. It's not just a magic pill you take and next day you are a changed person. It takes time. I had to go through the process. And at the end, I realized that I was able to walk on that path, controlling my anger, controlling my sadness, depression, anxiety, which helped me to build a bridge with my attacker. And it helped me to discover the inner strength and resilience I had, which I never knew I had that kind of resilience and strength until I faced the extreme evil. So it was not an easy path, but what I learned in my childhood, thinking about the consequence of my actions after this incident happened to me. And I also wanted to turn this nightmare into something very positive. I didn't want to see myself as a victim. I wanted to thrive. I wanted to utilize all the tools available in this great country to move forward and build a better life, turn my American nightmare into an American dream again. I can't even imagine the path that you've had to walk. There are so many levels to this that we can discuss that needs to be discussed systematically, racially, the hate, the biases, the fear. But going back to that moment when you were on the stretcher from the ambulance, looking at the sky and asking God that you wanted to live and you wanted a second chance. I can tell you based on our conversations, you know, offline, I would say you have done more for this country, America and others than most people that have not gone through a fifth 
of what you have had to endure and persist because you asking to have a second chance by miracle, thank God you're still sitting here, but you have been an advocate. Talk about the bill that you're trying to fight for and also how you're trying to combat hate because you have been on a mission to understand pain, understand hate, and how to turn it around, why it exists through this beautiful documentary that you have made. And I'd like to spotlight that a little. So first, talk a little bit about the bill that you're trying to get through. Sure. The pain and uh, impact of the September 11 terrorist attacks reached far beyond the initial tragedy in New York City, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C. The days and weeks following hate and violence against ethnic and religious minority communities shattered lives across America. Like, for example, Balavir Singh Sidhu, a Sikh in Mesa, Arizona, was killed while he was arranging American flag in his own gas station. Adil Karaz, a Coptic Christian, was murdered at a convenience store in San Gabriel, California. Wakar Hassan, a Pakistani-American, killed in Dallas, Texas, in his own grocery store. But the Patel was killed as well in Dallas by the same attacker, the same person. And the list goes on and on. As a nation, we come together each year rightfully to remember and mourn September 11. Unfortunately, the hate crime survivors and victims' families remain unnoticed and unsupported. The families of those lost and survivors like me continue to feel the irreparable pain and trauma. To recognize the 9-11 hate crime victims and survivors, I've been working with Congressman Eddie Bernice Johnson from Dallas, Texas, to propose a resolution to recognize the American Sikhs, Hindus, Christians, Arabs, Muslims, and all other Americans who were attacked and killed after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Right. Unfortunately, we ran out of time last year. And even though we received several co-sponsors, unfortunately, it was not passed. But that doesn't mean it's the end of the game. I don't know how to give up. So I'm settling up again, feeding the horses apples and <laughs> getting them ready. And I'm going to start riding my horse from all the way from Seattle to Washington, D.C. once again to gain more support and find ways to get this resolution passed to honor and recognize all the hate crime victims of 9-11 terrorist attacks. It's not a political or partisan issue. It's a pure American and human issue. And as a nation, we can do much better than this yeah. because the people who lost their lives, the children lost their fathers, the wives lost their husbands, need to find a way to close these wounds in their heart. And as a nation, this is something very simple we all can do to help these people yeah. to find ways to move forward. To be clear, Race, what is the bill supposed to do that you're trying to pass? For someone who's a layman's term that doesn't understand all these numbers and legislative jargon, what exactly are you fighting for in this bill? The actual goal behind this resolution is to recognize the American Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, Arabs, Muslims, and all other Americans who were attacked or killed after 9-11 terrorist attacks. In one word, to recognize all the victims of hate after 9-11. Let me just challenge you because I know there will be some people who, obviously when you talk about 9-11, Everyone remembers where they were that day, and it triggers a visceral and emotional response. So for those who may not understand, and they feel fearful of the Muslim community, or they still have these biases, and they feel like, no, you guys are not the victims. The victims were the people that were in the building that day, or in the Pentagon, or in the plane. What would you say to those people who would push back and say, how do you see these families as victims? And I'm just playing devil's advocate here. 
No, this is a very good question. Thank you for asking this because this resolution is not going to take anything away from the 9-11 victims in New York City, Pennsylvania, and Washington, yeah. D.C. That's not the purpose of this resolution. It's just we are trying to find ways to help heal these people who lost their loved ones after 9-11. If there was no 9-11, these people would not lose their loved ones. And survival like me, I would not endure what the trauma, the pain and suffering I went through. This resolution is not trying to take anything away from anyone. It's just trying to find help to recognize the people who yeah. faced extreme evil after the 9-11. This is my point of view. Yes, it's fear-based. Yes, it's ignorance. But shooting, let's call it what a shooting is. It's attempted murder. That's really what it is, right? This man, Mark, even though you have been unbelievably magnanimous, tried to get him pardoned and forgave him. He was trying to kill you. He shot you with the intent to murder you. That's attempted murder. And I think we need to call it like it is. And again, I want to put things in perspective. People can't forgive daily things. Here you are able to find peace through all of this pain and trauma and the nightmare of just trying to pay the finances of something that would incur a tremendous amount of stress, just trying to get through your medical treatments. So what you have endured is just unbelievable. Not only have you honored your ask of God to give you a second chance to live, you obviously have redefined what that means, living, like being alive, to live whereas many people just go through their day-to-day. -day. I want to talk about the documentary that you're producing. You have crisscrossed America on your own to put together this powerful, important story. Tell people about your documentary. What is it about? What inspired you to make this? Because I will tell people right out of the gate, after doing 27 years of entertainment and media, Production is no joke. Like even if I'm doing a one hour documentary with a studio or network, I'm working seven days a week, three months, four months, nonstop, don't see my family, laundry, forget it. You are working so hard and you are going out on your own, making this documentary, tell people about the documentary, what is it about and what do you hope to do within this important piece? Since I was gunned down and left to die. I know what it feels like to wake up each day with wounds of hate. I faced extreme hate and I wanted to understand more about where the hate comes from, why people hate and hurt others, and how people can find purpose and peace through their pain. And from finding peace through pain is a journey that I continue to find myself on to this very day. And I truly wanted to know more about this. So I, I set out to connect with people who courageously agreed to share their powerful stories and how they were able to overcome obstacles in their lives. From that, with the help of my partner, Mark Fraser, who worked in Hollywood for 15, 20 years, we traveled over the last year more than 17,000 miles in North America. And during this journey, we met people who inflicted pain onto others. For example, several reformed white supremacists, neo-Nazis, Proud Boys, and also people who endure tremendous trauma, like the victims and survivors of Pulse nightclub in Florida, the Charleston Church shooting, Charlottesville, Virginia, or the top supermarket in Buffalo, New York. They not only shared their powerful stories, but they also shared their journey in finding a powerful experience as a survivor, walking the similar path, we were able to build a strong bond. They felt comfortable sharing their powerful stories with me because they saw me as a survivor who endured tremendous trauma like them. Right. Who, who went to who understands. Past. So it helped them to exactly who understands. So it helped them to open up and made themselves vulnerable as well. 
And at the end, we captured a lot of powerful human stories. And human stories are powerful because it helps to build bridges, debunk myths, stereotypes, misinformation, fear, ignorance, and intolerance. And our focus was on healing, reconciliation, empathy, and forgiveness. And I can tell this much that this documentary will inspire people to reflect in word, softening their heart to the power of empathy, understanding, and forgiveness. The world is moving very fast. We're all working really hard to try to keep up and just to survive. But I do think that we have lost sight of one another and also looking inwards first. This is my personal opinion. There's so many questions that I want to ask you. So the first thing is, you have gone through so much, so much on every level, some levels that I probably am not even aware of, frankly. When you first came to this country, you had a reverence and a love for the American dream. You have endured so much and you have had to experience more than any human being should. And you endured what you deemed to call the second American nightmare as well. So looking back, do you still have that same reverence to America? And what does the American dream mean to you at this point? It seems like that we are more divided than ever before. I have experienced much more compassion and empathy in our country rather than intolerance, hate, and violence through my journey with this documentary film, right. through my personal journey, visiting 46 states in America, many small towns, many cities in America where I gave talks. I was invited to go and share my story. And this is what I learned that there's so much compassion and empathy and a generosity in our country. America is still a beacon of hope and prosperity to the rest of the world. We are divided, which is true, but that's not who we are. We are much more united. There is nothing that America cannot fix and achieve when we work together. This is the country where change is possible. This is the country where an immigrant like me, who was shot in the face, and left to die on a cold, concrete convenience store floor, was able to thrive, achieving his American dreams. And if I can do that, I think anyone can fulfill their dreams in this country because this country is so great. The tools are available in our society, but sometimes, sadly, and unfortunately, like my attacker, born and raised in this country, but fail to utilize the available tools fail to utilize all the opportunities that this country provides. It's unfortunate, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, but this is the reality that that tools are available. It depends on us how we utilize it. That does not mean that we all can flourish utilizing these tools because there are systemic oppression. There are right. challenges in our society. Yeah. But if we work together, if we reach out to our family members, people in our community, in our neighborhood, who all are struggling, if we just extend our arm, hey, what can I do for you? And that's why it goes back to the resolution that the people who lost their loved ones, who are still suffering because the homemaker, the widows who never imagined that one day they would become the breadwinner because they lost their husband, their breadwinner, turned into a hourly wage worker working in gas station in a fast food place. Still they're working, having no health insurance, cannot right. pay their medical bills, there's no money. So if we extend our hand to those people who are suffering in our community, we all can move forward. We all can find ways to enjoy life and fulfill our dreams. But sometimes we are so desensitized so often we are so isolated in our own silo that we forget what makes us an American. Yeah. What values, what principles that makes this country great. Because when I work in a restaurant, 
I would say that the best tipper in the world I experience is the American people. I, I work in a restaurant where I serve <laughs> people from all over the world. But Americans are the best tipper. They understand how it makes a big difference when you yes. take care of your server who serve your food, right? Right. And I'm not saying bad about other people, but I'm saying Americans understand this. Yeah. America is still the dream country. There is so much good in this country. This country still is a big enough hope and prosperity. And there is a system which is not perfect, but it is our individual and collective responsibility to make it better, take it to the next level. Yes. Rather blaming and pointing fingers, that will not take us anywhere. And that's why I don't give up because I know that I may not be able to crack the wall with one hammer, like one strike. One strike. Yes. Thank you. Yes. But if I keep constantly striking slowly without giving up, one day there will be a big crack. And the reason I say this, I never imagined that my attacker would ever have his heart changed because he never said sorry to us. He never apologized. He never even reached out to us. But this unconditional love and the forgiveness and mercy cracked his heart so profoundly that he could not just sit tight, not saying anything back to us and the other victims' families. And he wrote letters. He had a change of heart. And the worst possible place on ark, death row, he found Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and he became a better human being. And he wrote letter from death row where he explained how he was raised, what went wrong, how he could have fixed all these problems. So that gave me this extra fuel to fly this aircraft with the afterburner to go reach out to people and just help people to find ways to get to know the other, to reach out to people. Usually they would not go and have a conversation. Just find ways to meet people because once you get to know the other, it is hard for you to hate or hurt them. Yes. So here's the thing that I think is really interesting. One observation, and I'm going to hear if, you're, you, if you see this, and the second thing, I have one question, and then I'm going to ask you to sign us off. So you were in Bangladesh, right, watching American TV. Thank God you were not watching Baywatch. No offense to Baywatch. But, you know. No, I what? did. Oh, you did? I Just for maybe a few minutes here and there, okay. I wasn't allowed to watch. But as a kid, yeah, you get a sneak peek. You snuck it in. Yeah. But you were inspired more about the cowboys and the Western, right? So I'm assuming people overseas that don't know much about America, they see the American cowboy, which is the embodiment of what America is. Wholesome, fights for justice, is on a horse, wants the boots, feeding the horses with apples, all references that you've made, and fighting for what is right, correct? That's what the American cowboy image represents. Yes. What's interesting is that your love for this and this inspiration for the American dream, what America represents, also the cowboy. I think you are an unlikely embodiment of the American cowboy. <laughs> when you think American cowboy, you don't think about someone who looks like you, even if we were to put you in spurs, a stick a piece of hay in your mouth and put some fringe on you, and which I'm not endorsing fringe because I never understood that fad. But here you are still truly believing and representing every single day what America represents, the values, the truths that this country promises. And I think even though you're an unlikely candidate to be deemed an American cowboy. You are that American cowboy because you are fighting for and to defend and to uphold the values and truths that this country stands for. So that's my observation. Would you agree with that? And I could get you Ab a hat. That's not a problem. No, I, I, absolutely. Because what intrigued me watching Wild Wild West movies back in Bangladesh was the journey to find justice, to establish law and order in society, go after the people who are causing pain and suffering in community, in people's life. And the thrill, the, the drama, the suspense, everything in the Western movies 
it actually draw my attention that at the end, it's all about seeking justice, finding truth, going after truth and help people heal, reconcile, establish a peaceful society, right? Right. Cowboys is not a bad thing. That intrigued me and that's what I was glued to. And I kept watching more and more. And the more I watched, the more I felt that it's not only just the horse riding, but there's a deep meaning behind that. And living in Texas for 20 years, I understand that. Right. Though I have never rode a horse, but I have pictures with cowboy hats and before I was shot. And I bought books and buckles. And I also bought booklet when I work in restaurant to learn how to talk Texan. And it really inspired me big time. Some of the words I learned were very interesting to me. And I would never, ever would learn something like that if I never bought the booklet. For example, in Texas, if you want to address something like very big, you say big o. You don't say large. O. What? Big o. Big o. Yeah. Okay. Big o means large, huge. Yeah. Big o. This is a real cultural exchange <laughs> because I had no idea. <laughs> and then a popular breakfast item called eggs. Eggs. A i g s. Eggs is basically eggs. Are you sure this is Texas? Yes, I still have the book that I can share that with you. And every time I told my guests at the end of my service that y'all will come back and try our Texas LSD, I saw the shock in their face that what this brown guy is trying to say, that y'all will come back and try our Texas LSD. I put a smile on their face. Yeah. You're freaking me out, though, a little bit. But hey, man, if you want to go Texas, I can go New York all day long. Y'all do need to come back. You hear that <laughs> on I another like that. episode, if you will. <laughs> all right. I digress. Being that 9-11 was such a dark day in American history. And you have, again, endured and suffered just unimaginable experiences. And you still love America. You still believe in America. And you are still such a peaceful man. And I know that none of this was an easy reach. When you l remember 9-11 and all of the victims that were murdered in New York, in the Pentagon, in Philadelphia, and also who were killed and murdered because of the fear and hate in the fallout of the aftermath of 9-11, what is it that you want us to all remember? And how do you mark that day? Every year during 9-11, I deeply ponder what happened on the day, how it shaped our country and the entire world. Anytime I, I think about 9-11, I find, you know, um, many answers to my questions. Some positive and this is what I realized that in, in terms of crisis, Americans come together, no other nation. And our determination for justice and freedom transcends beliefs and borders. And such was the case during the aftermath of 9-11 terrorist attacks, the deadliest terrorist attacks our country has ever experienced. And I remember that through horrific tragedy and unspeakable loss, there was also a great unity. American flags were proudly raised everywhere throughout the country. And the nation came together. And once again, the strength and the resilience that is America prevailed on the day. And as I said before that, America is still a beacon of hope and prosperity for the world. And it seems to me and it seems to all of us that we are divided more than ever before. But I have witnessed throughout my journey, there is much more compassion and empathy in our country rather than intolerance, hate and violence. And on the day of 9-11 anniversary, I urge us all to find ways to come together, 
to get to know one another, just as we did 22 years ago. Yeah. This is a great country. We are a great nation. And um, every time I see there is hate and violence on our street, in our community, it reminds me, sadly, the great remarks of President Abraham Lincoln. And it terrifies me. He said that America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we ever falter and lose our freedoms, it would be because we have destroyed ourselves. Holy shit. Every time I see violence, hate in our country, I question myself and I want to question everyone that are we not destroying ourselves? We are foolish if we do not pay attention how we are decaying slowly by slowly how we are losing our morals and values and principle, what makes us great, what makes us a great country. So on this day of 9-11 anniversary, I would ask everyone, please reflect in war. Find ways to get to know our fellow citizens. Let's treat everyone as humans first, regardless of who we are, where we came from, how we look, who we worship, who we love. Because what makes America great is our diversity and our strength and resilience and our not giving up mentality, which is, there is nothing that America cannot fix and achieve. America is great because change is possible in this country and we can change ourselves. You really are an incredible human being race, truly. I'm going to ask you to sign us off right now. Let me know who you are and what you represent. My name is Reis Bhuyan. I am a human, a Muslim, a survivor, an American. I represent the other, the forgotten, the power and the impact of forgiveness. I also represent pain and peace. The world and lives were forever changed after 9-11. We experienced the spectrum of emotions that we all went through that day and for months afterwards, and for some are still struggling with to this day. We should always honor and remember the events and certainly the ones that we lost. One of the things that we can do to never forget and honor those who are lost is to be and to show the best of us every single day. I want to thank Race Bouillon for guesting, for sharing his incredible experiences, lessons, and for everything he's doing to live up to the promises that this country makes. If you'd like to learn more about race, I'll have his links in the episode description. Thank you so much for listening. Be good to yourself and to each other. Repin is a Suburban Outlaw Productions. Until next time, stand up and represent. <laughs>